Okay, we'd like to get started and all of you can uh, find your places and sit down. Where did they go? Here's Okay. Come on up, Michael. My name is Ray Kaufman and I'll be the MC. Before I introduce the candidates, I want to welcome all of you here. About all the chairs are full. And I want to introduce Terry Flagman. She's sitting back there and she's running also for the circuit court. And uh, her opponent, Rachel Gibson Mackwich, was here with the two other candidates in April. Well, you, you can feel free to sit down. <laughs> anyway, all four of them are here in April, and then uh, these two uh, got the top vote, so they face each other now in the general election. As I understand it, we have uh, one circuit court in Oregon, but we have, what, five positions? In Lynn County. In Lynn County, yes, five sure. Judges, yeah. yeah, five judges. Um, each of the candidates will have uh, up to 10 minutes to uh, 12. give an op 12, 12 minutes to give an opening statement. Oh, I should mention too that uh, there are restrooms in the hallway in the back. And uh, June here will be the, the timer. After their opening statements, they will take questions from the uh, audience. And we decided we wouldn't have you write out the questions. Uh, you can raise your hand and someone will be you. Um, our uh, two candidates are Faye Sets Waters right here. Faye Sets goes uh, first. I'm sorry, goes second. And Michael Winhausen over here uh, will go first now for the opening statement. So I want to begin by thanking you all for having us this evening and giving us an opportunity to speak with you and also to answer any questions that you might have. Uh, as he stated, my name is Michael Winhausen. I currently work for the Lynn County District Attorney's Office and have been working for the Lynn County DA's Office in total for a little over 15 years. Um, 
one of the things I've noticed since being on the campaign, it's been almost a year uh, that I've been on the campaign trail, and one of the things that I've noticed is that people uh, just don't know what judges do, and they have a lot of questions. So I'm looking forward to your questions later on. Uh, that said, let me tell you a little bit about myself. Uh, I was uh, born in Santa Monica, California, moved to the Northwest when I was very young, have lived predominantly in the Northwest since 1971 or two. Dad, you wanna? 72, there we go. Um, bounced between Portland and Seattle, uh, but predominantly in the Portland area. Went to high school in Portland, Jesuit High School. Uh, graduated in 1988 and uh, went to college, graduated from Santa Clara University in 1993 with a bachelor's in philosophy and a minor in theater, for what that was worth. Um, ended up going to the University of Oregon Law School, started there in 1993, uh, graduated in 1996 with a Juris Doctor degree as well as a certification in criminal law. Uh, after graduation, well, prior to graduation, I worked for the Lane County District Attorney's Office as a certified law student. I worked there for about a year and a half, and during that time I uh, did the work of a deputy district attorney, including uh, handling a few trials. Uh, after law school, my first job was with the Union County District Attorney's Office. I worked for Russ West, who's now a judge of the circuit court in Union County. Uh, I was there for about a year. Uh, anyone who's been to La Grand, if I show of hands, anyone? Beautiful, beautiful area, uh, out in the middle of nowhere. And uh, I, having grown up in the valley, I, I kind of wanted to come back to this area, and uh, I was lucky enough in 1997 uh, to have the opportunity to go to work for Jason Carlisle, who was the DA here for many, many years. Worked for him from 1997 to 1999. A former colleague of mine from the Lane County District Attorney's Office at that point was the chief deputy in Benton County. And she asked if I would be willing to come over and work for them. And so I did. Uh, I learned a valuable lesson at that time that money isn't everything. Uh, there was a, a fairly significant pay increase, but I just didn't necessarily care uh, for Benton County. And so uh, after six years, I was able to get back to Lynn County, again, working for Jason Carlisle. And I've been there ever since. Came back in 2005 after six years in Benton County. Over my 22 plus years as a prosecutor, I've uh, handled literally thousands of cases. I have been involved with hundreds of criminal trials. I've done work in the area of child support enforcement. I've done work in the area of juvenile delinquency, juvenile dependency, and civil commitments. Uh, one of the things that are important, you know, a lot of people will say, well, you've only been a prosecutor your whole career, which is true. But the fact of the matter is, uh, the law is very complex and lawyers specialize. Uh, you may be a specialist, as Ms. Terry Plagman is, in uh, family law. Uh, you may specialize with contracts or uh, tort litigation, any number of other things. And so you're gonna run across, uh, rarely will you run across an attorney who knows everything about everything. In fact, I would say that's a virtual impossibility in today's day and age with the complexity of the legal system. But what is consistent throughout the legal system, uh, particularly from the standpoint of a judge, is procedure and the rules of evidence. Those things cut through all areas of the law. And what a judge is asked to do is to preside over these cases, to listen to the evidence, to fairly and impartially administer those proceedings. And to do so effectively, one has to have a good handle on the rules of procedure and the rules of evidence. I have spent 22 years dealing with the rules of procedure and the rules of evidence. And the reason it is so crucial is because in any given case, if you don't know the rules, you're going to prevent evidence from coming into a case that should come in. You're going to allow evidence that shouldn't come in into a case. And that can sway 
the ultimate verdict one way or the other. In these cases, we're talking about people's lives. Okay? Whether it's a small claims case, whether it's a personal injury case, whether it's a divorce case, or whether it's a criminal case. There are lives hanging in the balance. And when you don't have the experience necessary to know the procedures and the rules, <coughs> mistakes get made. Evidence that should come in is prevented. Evidence that uh, shouldn't come in is allowed. And people who have suffered grievous injuries don't get their proper judgments. In a family law case, a person who shouldn't necessarily have custody of children gets it. And God forbid, in a criminal case, someone who shouldn't be convicted of a crime is. Or a victim of a crime doesn't get justice for the crimes committed against them. That is what I bring to the table. And as your next Lynn County Circuit Court judge, I will fairly and impartially implement the provisions of law that come before me. I will show due respect to those people that appear in court. I will make sure that public safety is upheld. You know, as a prosecutor for 22 years, I've seen two different kinds of people. There are people who make a mistake, people who have a bad day, people who have a lapse in judgment. And usually when they run afoul of the criminal justice system, that's enough of a wake up call. But then there are some other people that I deal with. People who habitually violate our laws. People who leave in their wake victim after victim after victim. These are people who have had opportunity after opportunity after opportunity to change their ways, to accept the treatment programs that are required of them by the law and by the judge who sentences them. And yet they continue to commit crimes. Those are people that need to be plucked out of our community to protect our citizens, our law-abiding citizens here in Lynn County. Now my experience in that area has recognized every single law enforcement agency in this county, outside of the Oregon State Police who don't get involved in politics, are endorsing my campaign. The last three sheriffs of Lynn County, including our current sheriff, Jim Young, Bruce Riley, and Tim Muller, are supporting my campaign. Doug Martini, the district attorney of Lynn County, endorses my campaign. Steve Dole, he's the president of Crime Victims United. That organization has endorsed my campaign. Andy Olson, state representative. Sherry Springer, state representative. Public officials and prominent citizens throughout Lynn County support me to be your next Lynn County Circuit Court judge. And I hope you will do the same by giving me your vote on November 6th. Thank you. Thank you, Michael uh, Greenhausen. Now, uh, Faye Stats Waters will speak to you. I want to thank Mennonite Village for inviting us to speak tonight. Being a circuit court judge is a professional dream come true for me. It allows me to bring the discipline I learned as a Marine, the calm demeanor instilled in me as a 911 dispatcher, and my legal experience as an attorney to Lynn County to be your judge in the courtroom. Further, it is a personal, is the latest of a personal step for me and brings me to Lynn County to call me my home. I didn't grow up here. I'm not from here. I'm from Baltimore when I chose this place as my home. In Baltimore, I grew up in a big family. Three brothers, a twin sister, yes, there is another one of me, <laughs> and my little baby sister. My dad was a groundskeeper and my mother was a homemaker. And as a child, I knew that the big city was not for me. I loved going to fresh air camp. 
I loved open spaces and green fields. As a senior in high school, my father died. I was lost and I didn't know what I was going to do. I grieved and then I rebelled. At 17, I did what many 17-year-olds do. I joined the Marine Corps. <laughs> it was good for me. I learned discipline and I learned perseverance. The Marine Corps showed me a world bigger than my hometown and formed in me a commitment to something larger than myself. To this day, serving our country as a Marine has been my proudest accomplishment. After the Marines, I went to work as a 911 dispatcher. I really like paramilitary structure. I worked the graveyard shift and I attended community college during the day. I knew I would have to work through school. I did not have people to support me in my higher education. But working with police, dispatching them to dangerous situations, dispatching fire, emergency medical technicians, canine units, marine units, you name it, gave me a profound respect for what our first responders deal with every day to keep us safe. But there were also things I saw every day that didn't sit well with me. I saw people's civil rights being violated. <coughs> I saw policies being violated. I asked questions. I realized I didn't have the power to do more. I didn't have the authority to do more. Eventually, I transferred from Manchester Community College to Trinity College, where I earned a bachelor's degree in history. My chief said, chief of police said, what are you going to do with a BA in history? He had a point. He said, you're always advocating for people. You're always asking questions. You should go to law school. It wasn't a bad idea. It was about this time that I met my sweetheart of 20 years. She is from Oregon. During our two-year courtship, she brought me out here to visit Oregon, and what I saw was beautiful. The people, the landscape, the community. I loved it. So I applied for law schools in Oregon, and I attended Lewis and Clark Law School in the evening program. Began because I knew I had to work through school. I clerked at the Oregon Department of Justice, where I, as a certified law student, represented the state in dependency matters, in, in the civil commitments and child support. It was a great experience. I also clerked at a private law firm and family law as well as a criminal defense firm. When my wife got a job teaching at Lynn Benton Community College, we decided to move to the valley to be closer to her parents. We bought our house in Albany. And then I was living in Lynn County and I saw the open spaces and the green fields that I yearned for as a child, and it felt like home. In the Valley, my first legal job here, I worked at Legal Aid. I served hundreds and hundreds of clients in Lynn and Benton counties. It was amazing. They had a wide variety of legal issues, and the people I served were poor. They couldn't afford attorneys. They lived below the poverty level but their legal issues were as important as any. We're talking about people who were fighting for custody of their children, they were facing losing their housing due to eviction, they needed protection orders to protect them from abuse. Wide range of, of legal need, guardianships, we had people who lost their uh, housing vouchers, we had disabled people whose temporary assistance was cut off by the state. And I was there to help them. I also led the Senior Law Program, which is a great program, and it really helped me expand my civil practice because the money wasn't tied to the Legal Aid Program, it was a separate grant. I helped seniors who needed income cap trust because they had too many assets to apply and uh, to be eligible for Medicaid. And so I helped them with those trusts so that they could get those benefits. I had seniors who were evicted from their assisted living facilities. I remember coming to the hearing the administrative law judge on one side and a bank of Portland lawyers on the other and me with my client, with her walker, trying to make our case. Those are the kinds of cases that helped me see representing the poorest members of our community. 
helped me see the economic barriers to justice. But it did, and the senior law program, I got to travel around the county. We had homebound seniors who still had legal problems. And so I would go to their houses. On one occasion in Sodaville, I, I pulled up to the house and on one side of the car there is a pit bull that's barking and on the other side there's a peacock that's hissing at me. And so I had to call the homeowner. I said, uh, I can't get out of the car. I hear a shrill whistle and next thing you know the two animals retreated and I was able to get out of the car and help her. You know, but what I saw all along the way was hardworking people. People who solidified my commitment to live and work in Lake County. When the economy tanked and we had a whole bunch of unemployed people living in our community and their unemployment insurance benefits were getting cut, I asked my supervisor, can I help the working poor? These people need our help and they need to get these benefits. And she said, yes. As a result, I became very skilled at administrative law. Many people don't know what administrative law is. It's a combination of constitutional law, statutory law, and internal policy. It's very important work. It's a combination of procedural due process and substantive, substantive due process. And eventually, I accepted work as an administrative law judge in that capacity and have worked from 2009 to 2016 in that capacity. As an administrative law judge, I had statewide jurisdiction. Not one community, but the whole state. I was no longer an advocate. An advocate takes a side, takes a position. I was working as an impartial decision maker. That's what judges do. Listening to all sides of an issue, weighing evidence, and coming to a decision based on the law and the facts. I presided over more than 4,000 hearings involving hundreds of Oregon statutes and administrative rules. And during those hearings, I made sure I listened to all sides and I issued thousands of legal opinions that you can find online if you were wondering what I was doing during this time period. My decisions could be appealed to the Appeals Board and the Court of Appeals. During every hearing, I preserved the right for people to be heard, I treated people even handedly, and I honored them, their right to be heard. That's what due process looks like. I did the same thing for the Pro Board, different capacity. I wanted to see what it looked like in a, different, in a different area of law. And so I was the hearings officer for the parole board. All day long, I worked with high risk offenders, predatory sex offenders, people who have deemed, been deemed dangerous offenders, people who are living in our community and who are on supervision and, and somehow had violated some term of their probation or parole. They were coming before a hearing before me to determine whether they were going to stay in the community with additional conditions or be returned to prison. In that capacity, I also heard sworn testimony, weighed evidence, made credibility findings, and issued thousands of decisions. Those decisions could be appealed as well. Hardened criminals told me I was the first person to ask them their side of the story. In fact, during one hearing, I heard a poem called Dirty Mike Had to Die. This man confessed to killing another person. He was, uh, he was on an extradition, he was being housed, and in the hearing he said, Judge, can I tell you something? Can I read you something? I said, how long is it? He says, it's one page. I said, okay. Rhyming couplets, he described how he killed his meth dealer. I said, you know, I have to do something with this. And he said, I know, but I heard that you were fair and I trust you to do the right thing. Prisoners, criminals back to prison and earn a reputation for fairness. All told, I've been in some kind of adjudic adjudicative position for over seven years. And when Judge Bispham uh, decided to retire, I put my name in the hat. I talked to James Egan, chief judge on the Court of Appeals about my decision. He said, go for it. And we talked about a plan. Now the governor depends on the local legal community to make recommendations for the circuit court appointments. And after several rounds of interviews, I was fortunate enough to be recommended to fill the governor's the vacancy. The process begins with numerous interviews, local Lynn County attorneys and judges and court staff. They are the ones who put my name forward and recommended me to the governor. And most recently, they affirmed that choice 
during the uh, Oregon State Bar's judicial preference poll. This is a poll that was sent out to Lynn County lawyers where they would vote between myself and Mr. Winhausen who they preferred to be the judge. 60% of those who participated picked me. I've been on the bench since November 2017. I'm the 45th person to serve as Lynn County judge, and I'm proud to have had the recommendation and support from those throughout the selection process and those who I work with every day, and I couldn't be more proud to serve this community. We don't have five judges. We're all generalists. We don't focus on one area of the law. We hear all kinds of cases. Is that the stop card? Is that the two-minute card? Finish the sentence. Okay. <laughs> Every day is different, and it's been amazing work for me. Thank you. Vote Stets White, November 6th. Thank you, Faye Stets Waters. Now we'll go to uh, questions. If you have a question for either uh, candidate, you can address that question to that person. And if you want uh, either one of them to take it, you don't need to say which one, or they both, both might want to comment on it. And uh, how much time do they have to answer the question? Two minutes. Two minutes to answer the question. Okay. Uh, you'll use 30, my mic here. 30 seconds. Got it. Okay. Thank you. 30 seconds. Don has a mic here, so raise your hand. Uh, Edie has one over here, I think. I saw this hand first. Okay, fine. <laughs> Thank you, Don. Push it out. I think we can hear you. If you wanted to just speak up, that'd be okay, too. Yeah, I am. Okay. Are you both running for the same office? Are you yes. <laughs> that, that makes it a hard choice because you're both pretty good. You have a good talk. So, I would only ask and I only ask one question. That there are times and places when compassion and judgment of two of identical circumstances may prevail, and which one do you, how do you determine that? How do you determine what one personal judgment has to, has to choose between which one is guilty of the law violation, or whatever it might happen to be? Because it needs compassion. If it didn't need compassion, you could do it with a computer, plug in all the facts, and this is the one that's guilty, you know. So, um, so I think that there's uh, perhaps a little, a little confusion. Absolutely within this job and in my job as a prosecutor, uh, compassion is important. However, when it comes to a determination of guilt or innocence, that is an issue of the law. And so a person, uh, the, the facts dictate uh, the outcome of the case. And so, uh, from my perspective, I think that, uh, and the jury instructions say this, to the trier of fact, you are to calmly and dispassionately evaluate the evidence and reach a just conclusion that is consistent with the law. And certainly that's what I would do as a judge. That said, um, every single case is different. So you wanna look at what are the facts and circumstances of that particular case? What did they actually do? Because with any given crime, the range of conduct can be quite broad. Uh, some can be very superficial but still violate the law, and others can be very egregious and violate that same law. In addition to that, I think it's necessary that you need to look at the person's criminal record. Is this a person who, as I said before, mm -hmm. had a bad day, made a mistake, uh, just something happened and it just didn't go the right way, versus someone who commits crime after crime after crime? Mm -hmm. uh, and those are the things that I would look at and those are the things that I would use to make my determination. Uh, that in addition to uh, the effect it had on the crime victim. So those are the things that I would weigh, but within that process, certainly compassion has a component and it should be considered. Did you 
either one of you loses this place, are you I'm sorry, we, 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 we want to go on to the next question after yeah. Faye has a chance. A wise person once told me that there is no justice without mercy. And as the judge, I see all kinds of people come into the courtroom with so many different circumstances. It's important to recognize the individual. How did this person get here? What are their circumstances? What is the background? I had a young man who was 36 years old who was who had suffered from mental illness, who was homeless. He was living in a field, and he removed, we would say stole, property from someone. It didn't belong to him. It was a coloring book and colored pencils. The rightful owner of the coloring book and colored pencils confronted him. What are you doing with that? Where did you get that? This person was startled and some type of shoving ensued and police were called. This person was arrested and charged with felony. This person agreed to a plea agreement in which he would be returned to prison. Now he had committed petty thefts all around the state, different counties, and so he was eligible for 20 months in prison. The state reduced it to 15 months in prison. And he said he wanted to go back to prison because there wasn't anyone here who cared for him. He had no place to live. And this was what he wanted to do. And it just crushed me that we have a system that allowed this, that, this, that we can do better as a community. And so, you know, Justice, yes, he was guilty. He agreed to a plea deal, and he was sentenced to prison. Is this the system that we want? Is this the result that we want? I'd like to hear from each of you uh, what you think the, the most important problems are in our criminal justice system? I think that's a big question. I know. One of them I talked to about it earlier is economic. We have a system that says if you have money, you get a different brand of justice. If you have status, you can get a different decision. If you have status and money, you can make your bail. You can be released from custody. You can remain in the community. And if you don't, then you, then you stay incarcerated. Then maybe you go to prison. And so I see people's, uh, you have, you don't, not everyone has access to lawyers. People, we do have uh, public defenders. We don't have enough of them. They are very overworked. A lot of our cases, 95, I'm told 95% of our cases settle. I told you about the settlement agreement, the plea agreement that, um, that was just one. But we have you know, a big disparity between how people are treated and it's mostly driven a lot by their resources. And so I think we need to look at those. That's a big problem throughout the criminal justice system. So one of the biggest problems for our criminal justice system is a situation where the uh, programs that are available to help folks just aren't doing the job. I've been doing this for over 20 years. Virtually every single person that comes before the court, whether it's a substance abuse issue, or a mental health issue, or a domestic violence issue, whatever it may be, we order people into treatment and they disregard it. Now there's only so much that we can do as a society to force people into treatment programs. And I guess I would point out one thing, 
you know, as a judge, when you're confronted with a situation that you feel is unjust, you can do something about it. Every single criminal defendant is told when they enter a plea, despite the fact that you may have an agreement between your, your attorney and the prosecutor, you understand that I, as the judge, am not obligated to follow that agreement. I can do what I want, what I think is just. And that's certainly what a judge should do. So in a case where one feels that 15 months in prison as an agreement is unjust, that judge can say, you know what, I don't think that's right. I'm gonna give you probation. So the judge can look at all those things and make that determination and reach a just result, and that's what they should do. So, and did you want to ask it of both of us? Or I, it's pretty simple, it's pretty straightforward. So, a person. So, but if, if she has a, another way of saying it, like. A, a civil commitment is a proceeding by which a person who is suffering from a mental disease or de defect, so they have a diagnosed medical illness. Um, and the question becomes does that mental health issue create a situation where that individual either poses a danger to themselves or others? or makes it impossible for them, makes them incapable of taking care of themselves. In that instance, uh, there can be what's called a civil commitment. So there is a proceeding, and if there is an ultimate finding that the person is suffering from a mental disease or defect, and that that mental disease or defect is causing them to be a danger to themselves or others, or being unable to care for themselves, that person can then be essentially forcibly placed into uh, a facility to get them back on track. Usually those kinds of cases, you're gonna have someone who can be medicated that will, will address their mental health issues. Uh, it's my understanding that those sorts of medications oftentimes have pretty negative side effects and that once people are not under that supervision and, and being required to take their medication, they stop. And uh, as a result, they decompensate. And oftentimes, unfortunately, they then turn to illicit substances like methamphetamine, and heroin and other substances, alcohol, uh, in order to medicate. And so the civil commitment is simply a process by which those individuals can be required to go into a, a secure facility to get them basically back to a healthy place uh, to the extent that that's possible. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Want to add anything, Faye? Mr. Winhausen uh, described it well. We have a lot of folks. We have a lot of folks in the community who suffer from mental health illness, mental health issues, and we don't have enough uh, support for them. We had a recent cut to Lynn County Mental Health uh, staff, and so we are operating at a deficit. And the court is currently seeing a lot more people who are suffering from mental illness who are intersecting with the criminal justice system. And we don't have a lot of services that look at those co-occurring. Uh, disorders, people who are mentally ill, and folks who are suffering from addiction. So we're seeing, and they end up in the criminal justice system, and the jail becomes the repository for these social problems. And so, it's something that needs to be addressed. Sounds like we have a man in the third row there. I have a, a question about uh, experience in in judicial efforts. Uh, being a judge, you're going to see 
civil, criminal, youth, all kinds of situations. And it's, to me, it's very important to know the kind of experience you've had in relation to pushing or moving cases through the court. So that would be uh, not only jury trials, but judge adjudications. Mm -hmm. So is there experience that you've had in, in getting cases to go perhaps as a, a prosecuting attorney? Actual court claim where there was a jury there and a judge, a jury. So uh, is, your, is your question directed to me? Both of you. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I have a, a lot of adjudicate experience. Like I said, I had statewide jurisdiction. I was an administrative law judge. I've been a judge on the bench since November. To give you an example of the type of cases I've held and presided over, I've had a, a jury trial on a Measure 11 case uh, involving a 12-person jury. I've had misdemeanor trials that I've presided over. Um, I've had... With a jury? Yes, you know. Adjudicated. I adjudicated. Right. Yes. Prosecuted. Yeah. No, I don't have any prosecutorial experience. I have civil law experience. And of course, the court doesn't just deal with um, criminal matters. Criminal cases don't make up the majority of the cases filed in the county court, but they take up a lot of the time. We have all kinds of cases that come before court, and some of our civil and family law attorneys complain that uh, uh, we spend a lot of our doctor time on criminal law. And so a judge has to be able to hear all kinds of cases. I'm actually the Family Law Advisory uh, Committee uh, Chair. I also am in charge of a, a workplace, uh, a dependency work group for juvenile law, and I'm also uh, working with the Juvenile Court Improvement Program. So, so I have a lot of administrative duties. So you're more social than criminal? I'm and more civil? No, uh, civil law is not social law. Civil law includes torts, it includes water law, property law, uh, small claims, it includes administrative law, a whole variety of, of, of laws. I can give you an example of what I uh, heard recently. Um, I presided over contested restraining orders, eviction trials, juvenile detention, juvenile dependency matters, domestic relations, child custody, civil commitment, probate, adoption, torts, small claims, judicial foreclosure, partition actions. I even had a wedding this, this afternoon. And so I can hear a wide variety of cases and have done so. Thanks for your question. Michael, add anything? Uh, so uh, I've been a litigator for over 22 years. That means I've been in court advocating for one side or the other, but in, this, in my case, I've been advocating for the state uh, in the area of criminal law. I have litigated thousands of cases in various forms, whether it be a motion hearing, a sentencing hearing, uh, trials. Now, I've had hundreds of jury trials in my career, in addition to other trials. So I, I have handled uh, many, many cases. I was admitted to the bar in 1996. I've been a member of the bar in good standing throughout that period of time. I didn't take any breaks. So in fact, I did my reporting again this year. So I've been a, a licensed attorney from 1996 to present. Okay? That is not something that my opponent can say. My opponent was admitted, uh, was it entered into the bar in May of 2007, and she voluntarily chose to become inactive in January of 2010. So she has, prior to her appointment to the position, she has less than three years as a licensed attorney. The areas that she practiced outside of that were not practicing law because it's illegal to practice law without a license. I would like to respond to that. Okay, you, you want to respond to oh, that? Well, I'd like to if respond I could to that. Finish, oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, no, no. Um, in fact, at the time of her appointment, Judge Stetswaters wasn't a licensed member of the bar. She was readmitted to the bar in November of 9th of last year, and she was appointed the position October 20th of last year. I'm sorry, Virginia, I just really need to respond to that, those inaccuracies that Mr. Winhausen has just stated. 
apparently he doesn't understand when you voluntarily make your, have your license go inactive, which any bar member can do. It does not mean you do not have a license. Your license is in an inactive status, and you can renew it to make it uh, active at any time. It's a fairly easy process, fairly easy. So to say that I was without a license is inaccurate. I'm going to read to, I'm going to read the letter from the Oregon State Bar. <laughs> and this is, there was some, I was, I had an inactive license and once I got the belief that I was going to be appointed, I said I better get my, act, my license activated so I can be activated and have an active license when I was sworn in. So on August 31st, 2017, the Oregon State Bar received your application for reinstatement. Our documents state that a reinstatement generally takes between three and six months to process. While your application remained in the process, under standard procedure, you requested to receive a temporary reinstatement to active status to be in effect for four months while formal reinstatement was processed. January 9th, you inquired about the status of your reinstatement application. We responded that our review was complete and we anticipate submitting it to the court that month. This was in keeping with our times, standard timelines. At this point, our staff made an administrative error and did not timely submit the application to the court for action. Our staff realized that your application had not been submitted to the court. Staff immediately contacted and submitted your application the same day. Your license to practice law has been active since November 9th. Further states, OSB conducted a thorough review of your reinstatement application, including all necessary background checks and favorably recommended your reinstatement to the Oregon Supreme Court. We apologize for the administrative error. Okay, I think there was another question on this side, or we'll come to this woman right here. That's right, she had her hand up. Thank you very much. Oh, there's probably 30 questions going through my brain right now, but I'll settle on a semi-easy one. Uh, what are your midterm and long-term goals should you win the uh, election to this seat? So as a judge, you get to see how effective the court works or how ineffective it works. Like I said, I had statewide jurisdiction and the other jobs that I had. And so I could see what was effective in other areas. And when I came to Glynn County, I saw, wow, there's a lot of inefficiency here. So short-term goals, I'm a veteran. The way we treat our veterans in court, I think, is deplorable. Our veterans have special needs, especially those who are suffering from PTSD, and they need special treatment. We ought to give them that chance to have those opportunities. We've had resistance from the district attorney's office saying we have enough diversion courts that we can meet the need through DV court, through drug treatment court, but they don't recognize the unique situation a veteran has been placed in and they have post-traumatic stress disorder. Now these folks have access to appropriate treatment by the VA, but they need leave from the court to be able to pursue those avenues. So short term, I would love to create a veterans court to help our veterans who are killing themselves to an alarming, at an alarming rate each day. Long term, I'd like to improve the efficiency of courts. We have had cases languishing in the courts for over two years. I had a 62 year old woman who was arrested for assault after she pushed her husband who was suffering from dementia and he had jerked the wheel. Someone saw this and called the police as a, and reported it as abuse. This person was arrested. She waited two years to get justice, and then she had to she entered a plea agreement. And we can do better. Streamlining our processes, making them more accessible to people, helping people understand and be prepared for the hearing that's before them, those are some of the things I'm interested in doing. Thanks for your question. So, probably the single biggest problem facing Lynn County is the docket. It is crushing. And as was stated previously, it sometimes takes years for cases to get adjudicated. Having been here in Lynn County for 15 years working with the local criminal defense consortium, we have some excellent attorneys who work for the defense consortium. Uh, they know their jobs. They do it very well. 
we all have a good understanding of how the facts will play out in court, and we have a good understanding of what the ultimate result will be. And so we're able to resolve cases amongst ourselves at a fairly high rate and in a reasonable way. That said, I'd like to see that kind of interaction occur between attorneys in other areas of law. And I understand that there are some other dynamics at play there. So I know a lot of people have said, and certainly Lynn County is due uh, for an additional judge or two. And, and there were due for additional defense attorneys, were due for additional prosecutors. Um, but we have the resources that we have. And so one of the things that the judges do, and some do it better than others, uh, is they engage in settlement conferences uh, where they'll sit down with the parties, go through the cases, and everyone does it a little bit differently. But what I would really like to see, and I think what would be particularly effective, is to make sure that all of the judges receive some specialized training on mediation and alternative dispute resolution so that they can help the parties resolve their cases in a fair way without clogging up the court system. So ultimately, we'll be able to do more cases and get better results going forward. sworn in on November 15th, my license was activated on, on uh, when were you sworn in? I was sworn on, sworn in on November 15th, November 15th, and this was activated on November 9th. But, but that was when you were sworn in? Yes. When did you know that you had been appointed? I knew October 15th. But when you're And I wasn't working as a judge, I was finishing up, up my work at my prior employment. And your employment. license was not active at that time? It was not active at that time, no. But and I inactivated my license uh, in 2010 because, for financial reasons. I went from working at Legal Aid, and anyone who's worked at Legal Aid, we served the poor, we were paid very low wages. And at the time, when I worked for Legal Aid, I had a loan assistance repayment program that was helping me repay back my very substantial student loan. Going to law school, I didn't have anybody healthy with law school, and so I had to take out loans to go to law school. Once the, uh, I took a job that wasn't with legal aid, I took a job with the state of Oregon. The state of Oregon said, you're an administrative law judge. You're going to be issuing legal decisions about people's substantive due process and procedural due process rights. You're working in a legal area. We're not going to pay for your professional liability. We're not going to pay for your CLEs. We're not going to pay for your bar license. And so it was a financial choice uh, because I was not being paid a lot of money to do that work. Uh, I couldn't afford it, and so I inactivated the license, and they said I did not need the license for the position. But to clarify, at the time that you were appointed, at the time that I was appointed, my license was not active. I still had a bar number, so there's a distinction. And you were in Benton County at that time, is that correct? At the time I was working in Benton County at Oregon State University, yes. When the governor appointed you. That's correct, after the local Lynn County lawyers approved my recommendation. Even though there were other... There were other people. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely, absolutely. Two of them are in the room, you know. Well, three of them are in the room. Well, the finalists, uh, there were two of us. Myself and Ms. Kitson McConish were the finalists, and there was another attorney. And of the three, the governor picked me. Over here, I'd like to have a question. Um, Mr. Warhausen, have you ever served as a judge? No, I haven't. I couldn't serve as a judge. Uh, there is a... Microphone. Okay. Uh, usually I don't need a microphone, but... Um, no, as a member of the executive branch, unlike attorneys who are in private practice who can apply to become what are called pro tem judges, 
Uh, so it's a temporary judge. Uh, to get that, well, to get that position, you need to have at least three years of experience just prior to the application for the position, and you also have to have two years of litigation experience. And while I would have qualified for that type of a position otherwise, um, because I was a member of the executive branch, it would be uh, a violation of the rules for me to be engaged in well, judicial activity. I just so, wondered if you had any experience as a judge. Not as a judge, no. Thank you. Next question. Can you hear me? Yes. If you will indulge me, uh, I'm from 2,300 miles away. That's where I grew up. Uh, you may detect an accent. Uh, and that may help you figure out where the 2,300 terminated. If you don't mind, excuse me. Uh, just briefly for my benefit, if no one else's, uh, would you generally describe the jurisdiction of the circuit court and how it fits into the, the s scheme of the court system in the state? Sure. So, um, so the circuit court covers all uh, criminal matters, all other legal matters. They don't deal with uh, the administrative as much, uh, we're handled by uh, referees or administrative law judges who aren't <coughs> practicing attorneys, but um, uh, they handle all the cases. They handle criminal cases, family law, uh, tort claims, small claims, uh, FEDs, which are landlord tenant issues. Any sort of case that will come to the court is within their jurisdiction. And then the next level of jurisdiction is the appellate court which would then review cases that come out of the circuit court, and then those cases can then be further reviewed by the Oregon Supreme Court. So there's three levels. Essentially, there are three levels. This is the trial court. This is the trial court, that's correct. Great. It has another one if no one else has a question. You got it, okay. If it's exercise tonight. Um, a lot of stuff you hear about in the newspaper today involves drugs. Are either of you or both of you familiar with the drug laws of Portugal? A small little country way over there, you know. Do you have you heard of it? You know I, I'm not familiar with that jurisdiction's rules regarding drugs. I'm I sorry. have heard about what was going on in Portugal, and it's pretty amazing. Uh, they actually have reduced their drug use by loosening their drug laws. They have no drug laws. That's they right. threw the book away. Yeah, that's right. Well, yeah. So, so let me say this. I, uh, I looked at the drug trends here in Lynn County over the last year. I've been involved for the last, not 20 years in Lynn County, but for quite some time, 20 years in the state of Oregon. And so here is what I have seen. Um, the drugs continue to flow in and people continue to use despite uh, every single situation in every single case where a person is either convicted of a drug crime or drugs are a part of whatever criminal activity they're engaged in, they are required, regardless of the level of supervision, unless it's a straight sentence, which generally doesn't occur, uh, they're required to go through a treatment program. Uh, and uh, they are required to go through an evaluation and go through treatment. What I have found is this, a lot of people ask me, how do we deal with the drug problem? How do we deal with the drug problem? And the only way that we're gonna be able to deal with the drug problem in this state and in this country is with a cultural change. We need to take on a campaign uh, similar to the campaign that was taken up against cigarettes, where it's almost, you know, people are social pariahs uh, because they are smoking cigarettes these days, and we should do the same with the, with the drug activity. We have seen the drugs increase and increase, except for a short period of time in, uh, after the law was changed regarding pseudoephedrine, when we had a bunch of drug labs, methamphetamine labs. It dropped then, but now we're getting tons of heroin. 90% of the heroin that comes into this country comes from Mexico, and it's manufactured there. 
And most of the methamphetamine that we get comes from there. And one of the things people don't, we hear about the opioid epidemic, there are more people dying from methamphetamine in this state than from opium or opiates uh, from heroin or fentanyl, which is another nasty drug, and we're getting that out of, out of China. We need to get our culture to, I hate to be trite about it, but just say no to drugs. <laughs> when I worked at the parole board, uh, I had uh, faced folks who were in the community and had been ordered to go to treatment. And I said, you were given an opportunity to go to treatment. Why do you go to treatment? Judge, I wasn't ready. Not ready to change. You can't force people to take treatment. It doesn't work. It has to come from an internal motivation to change. And I wonder how we can internally motivate people to move in that direction. We know that people have been punished, incarcerated, lost years off their life, health degraded, degraded because of drugs. It affects the brain. It harms the brain. People can't make rational decisions when they're on this stuff, and yet we ask them to. The science is that this is brain damage, and we need to look at it as though it is such. The way to stop the drug industry is to take the profit out of it. <laughs> no money. The judge no can't do that. It, 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 Sir, I'd like to um, go back to your response regarding drugs and the just say no kind of campaign. Sure. As a judge, how would you affect that stance? Here's the, here's the problem, and, and Faye was absolutely right in what she said. Until people are ready to get that treatment, until they've made the decision, I'm not going to do this anymore, uh, they won't do it. Uh, we can we can require them to go to treatment, uh, and they may start. We have a court here in Lynn County that has some mixed results, but I've seen graduates of that program back in the criminal justice system. So we have to weigh things. These uh, drug addiction doesn't happen in a vacuum. You don't just wake up one morning and all of a sudden, oops, I'm now addicted to drugs. Drug addiction, at its core, is a choice. It starts as a choice. You make that decision to use methamphetamine, to use heroin, to do these things. People make a choice. And here's the problem. Waiting around for people to make the decision to change their ways is going to leave in their wake victim after victim after victim. These people aren't just off using drugs and they're not doing anything else. They're breaking into cars. They're breaking into homes. They're stealing people's identities. So these people are leaving all these victims in their wake. And I understand being compassionate towards people who are suffering from drug addiction. But at the same time, we have to deal with the fact that they are committing crimes against law-abiding citizens in this county. And so there needs to be a balance in how we approach it. So, so I would just press you to please answer my question about how would you affect your stance just say no. Well, I think one of the ways to do that from the bench is through the juvenile system. Okay? You've got to make an effort early with people. But as a judge, it's it a judge alone can't make change that needs to occur. It's to start in the home. These children need to live in an environment where they have parents who are telling them that this isn't a good thing that they need to avoid doing this, rather than parents who are doing it themselves. But that's what we have. On the bench, I see lots of people who use control substances. And in the work that I have done in my career, I've known people to use control substances to self-medicate. People who have historical trauma, people who have been sexually assaulted as young people, as teenagers, in their early adulthood, 
are self-medicating, and the type of people who are using these drugs are not who we think they are. Sometimes it was your high school footballer who got hurt in a game and got some pills and then turned to street drugs and then turned to crime. And so this problem is affecting people who didn't think it was affecting. And so I think we have to have a, an approach that's a human approach that recognizes this is dangerous stuff, it's causing brain damage, and it's jeopardizing our future. If our little ones don't get the things that they need because they have been exposed to drugs, we have children who are born testing positive for methamphetamine. We have children who are taken away from their parents because they're needles and drug paraphernalia all around the home. We have this problem in our community and we need to address it. You know, forcing people to do anything is not gonna work. Is that the end? Does someone else have another question? So this week we've Many of us in this nation have been somewhat riveted to our televisions and listening to the radio with Justice, excuse me, Judge Kavanaugh's uh, confirmation hearings. Listening to both sides and watching the TV yesterday, I was struck for both people, Dr. Ford and Judge Kavanaugh, both claimed that they were 100% sure of exactly where they stood. What, what their involvement in, in the alleged incidents was. He was not there, or he was there. One of them has their fact correct. One of the things that I've noticed in the justice system, and I bring that up because I know a lot of people have been watching that and it's a little bit different, but it's still a, a quasi courtroom setting. But in the justice system, in, in our courts today, what I have personally seen is there's a lot of plea bargaining going on where the accused is now guilty until proven innocent, that the accused has to prove their guilt. I mean, their, their innocence versus the other way around, where generally it's supposed to be the prosecution has to prove guilt beyond a reasonable shadow of a doubt. Correct? Okay. Beyond a reasonable doubt, that's correct. Right, okay, beyond a reasonable doubt. I know I said that too many words. Um, so this is, this is my question. So from the bench side of it, when you're looking at a case and you're going, okay, this person is feeling the pressure to enter into this plea bargain because they feel threatened by the other side, even though they know in their heart that they are innocent or that the circumstances that were presented, that's why I bring up the Kavanaugh and Ford thing because both claim the same innocence of, or the same, you know, the same event with a different view. And so when you've got a, an accused standing there, how do you, as a judge, view that? Do you look at that and go, wow, this person could be underneath a lot of pressure to accept this plea bargain where they're not getting the true benefit of the court system because there's too many cases? And then, Michael, from, because you've been on that prosecutor, prosecutorial side, I'd like to hear your view of how you would change that from the bench. Does that make sense? So I, I think I can handle it all. So, so one of the things, we, we get a lot of plea agreements. I spent uh, all day doing sentencing today. Uh, mm -hmm. And so much of that was plea agreement. There wasn't a conviction from a trial. We have a high volume docket. We have a lot of process. We call it 15 minute justice. We have these hearings that are set for 15 minutes where a defendant has to leave work, come to the court for 15 minutes for us to set another date. How many times do you think a defendant is going to be able to leave work if they're an hourly employee and have to explain to their employer, i got to go to court again, or what's happening with the case, well, I don't know, it's not really doing anything. Well, that person might feel compelled to just give in. I'm tired of this. It's taking too long. I've told you cases take two years to be resolved. There's a lot of pressure to do that. So when I take an agree plea agreement, I'm asking questions. I'm looking at body language. If someone can't answer the question of checking with their defense attorney a lot, well, stop it. Is this what you really want to do? And that's what I did with the young man with the calling book. Is this really what you want to do? And he explained, this is what I really want to do. I have no else to go. 
And so it's taking measure of the full person. What is their body language saying? Are they really, have they seen the document? A lot of times the defense attorneys have seen their client. They just put up a piece of paper. I'm asking, did you read this piece of paper? Do you know what it says? Do you intend to give up all these rights? And they say yes. Is this what you really want to do? And they say yes. You know, hopefully people, we've had some people say, no, last minute, I don't want to do it. This isn't the deal that I wanted. I'm going to say no. But we have to do that inquiry to make sure that this is a voluntary, knowing agreement that this is what they signed on to. But I agree with you, there's a lot of it. Unfortunately, we have such a volume that people do agree to it. Can I, can I follow? Because I want to clarify, because I realized I missed one thing in that question. And I'll say it, say it loud enough so y'all can hear me. Is that sometimes there's people out there going, I'm, I'm innocent, I know in my heart that I'm innocent. Mm -hmm. Just like Judge Kavanaugh says, I'm innocent. Dr. Ford said she's not. Okay, okay. so prosecution, right. victim, okay. But yet they're feeling, if I don't take this plea bargain, they're, they're kind of feeling, I feel like I have no option because the alternative of facing five years in prison for a crime I didn't commit mm -hmm. are worse, and so I'm gonna take this plea bargain from the judge, from the bench. Mm -hmm. How do you, do you sense that? And then Michael, from, from that prosecution, so like, my apologies for not yeah. being informed. I, I haven't had a person say it. I'm innocent, I didn't do it, and when they do that, they, they take it to trial. Okay, Michael. So as a judge, your job is to fairly and impartially administer the law. In the context that you're explaining, it, it is not the place of a judge to intervene in that system. Now, certainly a judge needs to ensure that a person is made fully aware of their rights, fully aware of all the rights that they would need to give up. So in entering a plea, you're giving up your right to remain silent, you're giving, your right, giving up your right to a jury trial. You're giving up your right to have, be represented by counsel and in cases where you can't afford it, uh, to have one appointed and, uh, by the court and to handle your case. Judges are often asked to evaluate a case during a settlement conference where they look at the evidence, but, but the situation is this. Facts drive these cases. And uh, so, in the, in the context of the Kavanaugh situation, what I would say is this. You're going to have a situation as a trier of fact to look at that and say, is there evidence beyond a reasonable doubt to prove the allegation in question? That's the issue. And we have that high standard for a reason. Because we want to make sure that the evidence is beyond reproach. And so we want to make sure that there is that high standard. And the state has to meet that burden. In any case that I have, I am responsible to prove each and every element of an offense beyond a reasonable doubt. And it's the judge's job to make sure that the process is administered fairly and impartially. Okay, uh, is there another question from someone who hasn't asked a question yet? Terry has one back here. And then I think we'll take one more after this one. Thank you. 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 I want to take the opportunity to ask both of you a question that I am honestly curious about the answer to. And that is, what is both of your positions on uh, Measure 11 crimes involving juveniles? So, uh, under Measure 11, only juveniles who are 16 years of age or 15 years of age or older may be charged with what is referred to as a Measure 11, a crime, be charged as an adult. Uh, that's a decision that needs to be made uh, by the prosecuting attorney. Um, now, with regard to mandatory minimum sentences in general, uh, my stance on it is I don't like I don't like Measure 11. I don't like repeat property offender statutes. 
I don't like determinate sentences under ORS 137, 635. I don't like the sentencing guidelines. In my opinion, judges, well, judges are elected officials, or they're supposed to be. And in my opinion, if we're electing people to be our judges, then our judges should be the ones making these decisions. And the way they make those decisions, the way they make those decisions properly is to look at all of the facts, to look at the person's history, and to reach a just sentence. And so with regard to juveniles, oftentimes we want to treat them as juveniles. And so there's an option to, to not impose the Measure 11 case. On the other hand, I have seen cases involving juveniles Sexual assaults, serious assaults, even homicides. And so you've got to look at each case individually and decide how you're going to proceed and try to reach a just result. Eleven juveniles. I've been to McLaren and I've seen the youth who are spending their formative years in an institution. This is the law of the land. Uh, this is the law that we must apply. I don't like it, but it's not for me to like it. My job is to apply the law as it is. And this is where people have a voice. If they don't like it, they can go to the legislature and they can ask for it to be changed. When it's your grandson or your granddaughter who's been victimized or who's, who's been accused, you know, then I think that people will think differently about it. I think the rudeness of, of crime allows people to look at through a long lens and a criminal justice lens without looking at the full person in the situation in which they've grown up. You know, we have children who don't have good role models, who don't have good parents, and who uh, live in an environment of bullying, of victimizing, of name calling. And when that th those things are not um, monitored, it grows into something, you know, more dangerous. And so we as a, as a culture, I think, you know, have to be concerned about these kinds of things. But it is the law, we have to apply it, but I don't like it. Thanks for your question. Okay. I, I thought that was the last question. No, I said one more. Okay. Okay, uh, about 14 years ago, I had a problem with the uh, justice system. Uh, I had a renter that was picked up. And arrested for manufacturing, growing marijuana in my rental. And uh, I went down and I read five police reports. And uh, I went to court. And when I got there, the district attorney told me I could not say anything. Everything was settled. And I thought I had $3,500 of property damage at my rental. And in the police report, it showed that the checkbook that I had been getting my rent from had $87,000 in it. And so I told the district attorney, I'm going to be standing up talking to the judge when he comes in. And I don't care what you're doing. And so. The judge apparently let the district attorney and the defense attorney, whatever, completely solve the case outside of court. And all he was going to do is say, OK. But since I did stand up, and then the district attorney uh, recognized me and introduced me, and said what my deal was, and the judge says, I don't know anything about this. And so I don't see how the judge, if we're elected judges to decide court cases, why the attorneys can blindly, and apparently the judge didn't know the guy had $87,000 in his account, because what he did do, the defendant, he asked the defendant if he would pay the $3,500, which he agreed to do, the judge let him pay it after he got done with his sentence and payments 
And I waited forever for that. And I don't think things ought to be handled like that. And I think that the judge ought to be aware of what the police report says before anybody just throws everything down. Okay, why, is, why are things being done like that? Great question. <laughs> you know, when I was working as an attorney, when I worked as an administrative law judge and a hearings officer, I got all those reports, just like that. You know, the probation parole would send them to me, I could read them, I had information right in front of me to help make the decision. As a judge, you don't get those reports. I don't see one police report. All I have is what the attorneys report in court. People think the judge has all, has all the information. We don't. We have to make our decision impartially, neutrally. We don't get a police report. The only time I see a police report, if I see it all, is in the context of a warrant. Someone has requested a warrant in the middle of the night, and I'm reading a search warrant, but that's not even a police report. So I don't get the police reports. Judges don't get them. They only get what the attorneys represent in court. Now we have these in documents, but we don't have those reports, so we re re rely on the attorney's representations in So, not knowing everything about your case, it sounds like you were a victim of a crime, in which case, under our Constitution, you have a number of rights. Uh, you have the right to at least be consulted with, regarding plea negotiations, you have the right to full restitution, uh, and certainly uh, there could be arrangements made to get uh, payments made up, up front or in advance through the form of a compensatory fine rather than restitution, which can be done piecemeal. Now, I will say this, the structure has been set up by the legislature. So the legislature writes the laws that govern both the executive branch, the prosecutor, as well as, as the judges. Um, with regard to the additional information, so I, I'm a little surprised, I don't know how long ago this was, but um, it's, it's disturbing to hear that. And every once in a while I hear these stories, but I know that our office sends out a notice to every single crime victim and gives them an opportunity to say, I want to be involved, I want to be consulted regarding plea negotiations, I want, you know, this is how much restitution I'm owed, uh, I want to be in court, I want to be notified of all appearances. These are all rights that every crime victim in the state has. Now one thing I will say with regard to the information for the judges, um, when I was practicing, started practicing and until not, well, a while back, um, we used to get what we called pre-sentencing investigation reports, and those would go to all parties, including the judge. And there would be a comprehensive report prepared by someone from the Lynn County Parole and Probation Department, or where, whatever county it happened to be, and it would lay out the person's criminal history, the underlying facts of the case, and oftentimes they would even make recommendations to the court. Uh, but because of budget restrictions and changes in the law, again, legislature, uh, they've done away with pre-sentencing investigation reports, and so that's something that's lacking. And so the judges do have to rely on the parties. Okay, thank you for all of your uh, good questions. Uh, I think we'll close the question and uh, answer part now. And maybe after the meeting closes, if the candidates hang around and you have another question you want to ask them, you can come up and do that. We're going to have closing uh, we're going to wait. We're going to have closing speeches now. I think of three minutes each from both candidates. And I think since Michael Winhausen went first, we'll have Faith Fitzwaters go first here. Thank you. Again, I want to thank everyone for coming tonight. I know there are other things that you could do on a Friday evening, but I'm encouraged that you care about who sits on the bench. It's important to have a judge who has a history, a demonstrated history, of being impartial, of being fair, of giving people an opportunity to be heard and who regards proper due process. I have that experience. I've been doing this type of work since 2009, and I've been doing it well. I've had statewide jurisdiction, and now I'm focused on Lynn County. You need a judge who has experience being fair. 
You, have a, you need to have a judge who has experience, a broad range of experience, who's not looking at the criminal justice lens. There are so many cases that come before the court where it's dangerous to have that black and white view, looking for a bad guy, looking for someone to blame, being punitive. It doesn't work in most areas of the court. You need to have a judge who has a broad range of experience and who understands that. You need to have someone who's willing to listen, not prejudge, not come to the table with biases, not pointing the finger at people. You need to have a judge who's willing to be open to listening to all sides, all points of view, and not having their mind pre-made up about who is a criminal and who is not. It serves no purpose to label human beings this way. We have to understand and recognize the humanity in people. That person you are calling a criminal is someone's father, is someone's son, is someone's brother. And we have to ask the questions, how did they get there? How did they become so broken? We need to take time and be individually looking at this person. The problem with our system is we want a one-size-fits-all remedy. We want to do it fast, and we want to be quick, and we want to be dirty, and we want to be done with it, because we don't want to think about the long terms. People require appropriate attention and time to figure out what is their story, what is their history, what do you need to make you a well, productive member of our community. We have people living on the streets. We have people living in the woods. We have people who are mentally ill, and we're throwing them in prison. We're throwing them in jail. We have a shortage of resources. You have a role in determining how our resources are used. You can help the court get the resources it needs. And I hope that you will join me in voting for Stats Warriors when, uh, like the uh, bar judicial, judicial preference poll, the lawyers, local Wood County lawyers, said vote just judge Stats Warriors. Thank you. about labeling people criminals. A person is a criminal when they commit a crime and are found guilty of it or enter a plea. That's when they become a criminal. What I heard lost in the statements of my opponent were the victims. Not once did I hear a word talking about people who have been victimized, people who commit crime after crime, after crime. Now, I can appreciate that people who end up getting involved in the criminal justice system have a bad day and make a mistake, and that's something that I can recognize based on my experience. But the fact of the matter is, with every crime, you have a victim. And you can't just hug the criminals and ignore the victims. We see people hurt every single day, and they're ignored. We see people who are more worried about the people who victimize the citizens of Lynn County than the victims themselves. That is something I will not tolerate. I don't tolerate it as a prosecutor, and I will not tolerate it as your next Lynn County Circuit Court judge. Now that is not to say, as uh, it was characterized, that I prejudge these cases. I look at the evidence, I look at the facts, and I apply the law. That's what I've been doing for over 22 years as a licensed, active attorney. I know the difference. But to think that you can just wave a magic wand and it will change and not hold people accountable is unreasonable and frankly, it's dangerous. I've been in this community for over, well, over 20 years now. I know the system. 
I know the people, I know the courthouse, and I have the support of the citizens of Lynn County. And I'm asking for your vote on November 6th. Thank you. Yes, thank, uh, thank you both candidates. Sorry, job well done. I want to thank uh, Pat Ling Lingvis over here to uh, help us with our sound system. <laughs> and we're grateful to Mennonite Village for the use of the Lakeside Center and for the setting up. <laughs> Is there any other announcement that needs to be made, Jim or Don? Too bad we don't have more October 8th, these two candidates, oh no, Ten. October 8th, uh, there will be a forum at the library at 7 p.m. Has that changed? I think it's the 10th. Yeah, Monday the 10th. Okay. It, it's, uh, the it's October 8th. It is a Monday. It is uh, a forum for District 15. Oh, which we all belong to. Um, it's a, uh, uh, what? <laughs> I've invited all of the uh, candidates who are running for the position of state representative for District 15, and there are three of them at, at, at this point. Uh, and it's about two, two of them have, have uh, accepted and we're awaiting word from the third but we will proceed with the forum regardless and, it's about care. and uh, we're going to emphasize in the first half health care issues in the state of oregon and in the second half we're going to take a look at the, at the ballot measures so uh they're they're going to have they're going to be busy answering those questions what time again seven o'clock at the library on the 8th, and then on the 10th, these good people will be coming with the other two people who are running right there, oh. who are running for the other district, District 3, and position, three. Position, three. position 3, and Position 1. So um, that's 7 o'clock on the 10th, Wednesday, the 10th, Where? at the library, library. 7 o'clock. All right, you're dismissed. Thank you for being here. And if anybody has any other questions, I know there were other hands, I'd be happy to If you have questions, I'd like to ask you, so are you familiar with the law school? Yes. Well, I was saying that I think that we're
Mr. Winhausen, any last thing to say to the Facebook viewers? Uh, no, thank you very much for watching if you did, and don't forget to vote in November. Perfect. Thanks.